OK, welcome, everyone, to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. My name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google in Switzerland. And uh, part of what I do is talk with webmasters, publishers, people who make websites, like some of those here in the Hangout now, and some of you who submitted questions already. Um, I try to bring all the information back to the teams internally as well to make sure that they're aware of your worries and uh, that you're aware of where we're headed and the kind of questions that we're running across. So maybe we can just get started with one of you guys, a question from one of you. Yeah, mobile usability. OK, Alec, go ahead. I uh, just wanted to know, uh, at least maybe, is it throughout the summertime, will it become a ranking factor? Because it kind of feels that we're reaching that point. Um, I just, I know you can't disclose certain things, but I just wanted to know. Uh, really focusing on that uh, quite a lot uh, because of the usability errors, because some, uh, a lot of uh, different clients, uh, it's starting to pop up because I always check it. Now the errors are there. Yeah, I mean, this is something where we've seen the trend head towards mobile, towards smartphone for quite a while now. And we've been really pushing in that direction. I think two years ago, we did a blog post about some initial changes we made with ranking changes with regards to mobile sites, issues that are popping up there. And uh, recently, I think in December, when we launched a mobile-friendly label, we also mentioned that we're working on experiments there. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see more in that direction. But at the moment, I don't have anything specific to announce. And it's probably not something where we'd say, well, we're going to do this in the summer. Um, I imagine before we do something bigger around that, we'll probably do a blog post and give some more information out for the general public as well. So a blog post and then announce the date, yeah? When it's going to be a ranking factor. We'll see what, what we get to. So okay. I think, uh, in general, when we when we make these kind of changes, we'll try to put them out in a blog post, because this is something that is essentially a technical issue that the webmasters can solve. And uh, if uh, we don't surprise them by that, then our hope is that they'll make more mobile-friendly sites that work well for users, both their users and our users. So no, nothing has been baked in yet in terms of ranking uh, around mobile outside in this new algorithm that we're talking about? I mean, we're always experimenting. So it's possible that some of you guys are seeing experiments happening. Um, at the moment, it's not something where we have anything definitive to announce just yet. OK, thank you. Thank you. All right, can I go ahead with a question, John? Sure, go for it. Uh, so uh, I have a friend with us, a pretty unique case. Well, at least uh, it's a unique case from my experience. Um, this is actually also related to your announcement regarding Google bot crawling from uh, different uh, IPs, uh, geo-targeted uh, crawling. And uh, I don't know if this applies to international, so other countries than the US. Uh, my client is in Romania. And uh, uh, he basically uh, redirects the user based on what city from Romania uh, the user enters the website, he direct, redirects him to a page specific to that city. And uh, uh, as far as I know, he uses a 302 redirect. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what, what the best practice uh, is or if the Google bot would be able to see now that's uh, uh, the geo-targeted crawling thing going on. Um, at, at the moment, we're not quite at that level of detail. So uh, I think we're crawling from just from a handful of locations, and those are individual countries. And I don't think it would make sense for a crawl from, say, all countries and all cities to see all variations of the content right, that we would see. So I imagine the number of countries will grow over time as, as we see if this makes sense or if this doesn't make sense. But uh, it's probably not going to happen that we'll crawl from individual cities and say, oh, we have a crawler based on each of these ma major cities in Romania, and we'll see what each city would see. I don't think that would make sense, because then we'd have to crawl these websites like, thousands of times, the same URLs. Right. As I said, it's a pretty unique case, because I haven't uh, actually met uh, anyone else with uh, this specific scenario. 
So uh, do you think it's a good practice uh, to, to redirect the users uh, with a 302 redirect? Because uh, I'm not sure what to do. Uh, basically, making a single page, the home page, where a user would be able to choose his city is not an option. So they really want to redirect the user to the exact, uh, that exact page that's, that has content relevant to, to the city of the user. What, what would, would be the best idea on how to configure that? So technically, a 302 redirect would be the, the right way to do that. That's one that wouldn't get cached on a network level. So it wouldn't be the case that like one user visits this and a, di same, a different user going through the same ISP sees the cache redirect. They would see be sent to the main page again and then redirect it wherever. So the 302 would be the technically right way to do that. I can make sure that the individual city pages can be crawled and indexed separately so that we can pick all of those up. Um, what will happen is probably Googlebot will be redirected to, I don't know, one page or a generic page. And we'll kind of see that as the home page. So if there's something really unique on the home page that needs to be associated with the site in general, then that's something you should show to Googlebot as well. Um, otherwise, as long as we can crawl the individual city pages, as long as they're kind of linked between each other, like within the website, then I don't see much of a problem there. There's some sites that do that, uh, that are pretty successful with that. It's always, I think, a te technical difficulty to do it uh, correct, but it's theoretically possible. Uh, so should we allow Googlebot on the main page without redirecting it, or is that not such a good idea? You should treat Googlebot like any other user from the same region. So if you treat users in the US by showing a I don't know, a generic page because they're not in Romania, then that would be what Googlebot would see. Yeah, yeah, OK, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. All right. Uh, we have the hreflang question from Arthur. Um, sitemaps, hreflang implementation, a site has two languages, English and French. There should be two distinct URL blocks. Each should contain a loc block uh, tag for each language URL, and then a link to example. Uh, can I place only one URL block to save some space in there? Uh, no, you would need to keep them separate. So we need to see the confirmation from both of these pages. So the English page should uh, refer to the French page, and uh, optionally to the English page as well. And the French page should refer to the English page, and op optionally to the French page as well. So we kind of need that confirmation from both sides. So only putting them into one block will essentially lead to us saying, this is not a confirmed hreflang markup, and we'll ignore it. And that's something we'd also show in the hreflang uh, status or error section in Webmaster Tools. Uh, duplicate content, keyword stuffed content, hidden in tabs, expandable modules, is, is that going to affect the website? Or will it be ignored like all other hidden content and tabs that doesn't go toward a web page's rank? Um, my general advice there would be to say, if you're aware of keyword stuffing and hidden content that you're just putting on those pages for search engines, and that's something I'd fix regardless of whether or not Googlebot would pick up on that or not. So if you're aware of this kind of thing, I, I just clean that up. And then you don't have to worry about what what Googlebot actually does with that. In general, when it comes to hidden content, stuff in tabs, those kind of things, that's something where we'll try to treat that as something that's, uh, on the one hand, we can crawl and index it if we can find it there. On the other hand, it's something we're not going to treat with the same weight as really visible content. So if there's something really important on your page, then make sure it's visible. If there's something that's kind of auxiliary content, then by all means, put that in a tab or something like that. But uh, if you're aware of that, this content just being keyword stuffing or just like uh, hidden text in there for rankings, then that's something I I just clean up. I just uh, kind of get rid of that. Uh, how often does Google update the page layout algorithm? When the algorithm was first launched, Google told us we have to wait several weeks to see changes. When a site is hit, we've been waiting almost four months now. Um, how long is several weeks? I guess, theoretically, several weeks can be several weeks. So I can't really, 
I don't really have any fixed number for that. Uh, in general, we don't announce a, a fixed cycle for most of these algorithms. So we try to update them as frequently as, as we can. For some of these, we, we kind of have to update the data first, which takes a bit of time to kind of reprocess, re-render all of these pages to see what they actually look like. So that's something where we're probably not going to say this is going to run every month or every other month. Uh, it's essentially going to happen when, when we can make sure that the data works right. Um, John, could you say, have there been any panda or penguin changes in the past, uh, I guess, since late December? <laughs> panda or penguin know. changes since last December? I don't know for sure. You want to guess and not say? You know, I'm gonna say I guess it might be maybe. Like from one to ten, uh, ten being the highest. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Let me pull up that that tweet where I can confirm that I have nothing to confirm, <laughs> or what was that? Yeah, I I, I don't know. I, I uh, this is something where generally we, we don't treat this as something very really critical internally, and when these update, they update. And it's not like we're watching our engineers' hands to see what they're actually doing and kind of doing the things like every week or something like that. So these are essentially algorithms that we see as lots of other algorithms that are active in search. And uh, we, we don't necessarily like send out internal newsletters saying that, hey, this algorithm ran today. And, uh, well, just like uh, Google Trends, you know, uh, it would be nice if we could see all the 200 algos uh, going, you know, at once. And uh, this way yeah. we will see what has been updated. We'll see that Panda has been updated, Penguin, and so on. But, like, there's 200, you know. We'd love this graph like that. That's really hard because uh, kind of also because of the way that the, these things work internally. It's not... Uh, for a lot of these algorithms, it's not something where this algorithm launches today and we'll see it live within like five minutes. It might launch today, and it'll take a, a couple of weeks for the data to kind of be processed and be updated, and it'll be kind of continuously updated like that. So that's something where there's sometimes no clear cutoff date where we can say, this happened today, and you'll see the change tomorrow or uh, in a couple of hours. John, let's say I'm in, uh, let's say for example, let's say I'm in Seattle, and then the next day I'm in Atlanta, and I see different, like for instance, when I was there, like the results are totally different. Is that because the update hasn't reached that specific server yet? Because for instance, in Atlanta, you guys have like a, a popular area there where mm -hmm. I guess the Google, where the servers are. So like, does it update there, and then it kind of slowly rolls out through all the states, or? Um, usually, usually we're pretty quick with updates across the data centers. So usually you wouldn't see that much of a difference between the data centers. What you usually see more of is kind of the experiments that we're always running. And we're, we're always running, I don't know, 100, 200, 300 experiments at the same time. And when you're searching, you might be in any number of those. So that's something where you'll probably see more of the changes based on that. You might also see changes based on uh, geotargeting and your location, especially if you're doing local searches. If you're yeah. searching for a plumber, obviously, if you're in New York, you'll see different results than if you're in San Francisco. So that's the kind of thing where we do take geotargeting into account. OK. So there's no latency like uh, between? I mean, there is some latency between these data centers, but uh, we have a really good infrastructure in place where if we make changes, then they're pretty much active everywhere at the same time. And sometimes something breaks, some, some wires, I don't know, get cut because someone digs a hole in the garden and there happens to be this big fiber optic cable going in through underneath. I don't know, probably not that common, but theoretically these things can happen. And it might happen that one of the data centers is a little bit behind or doesn't have the full data. But usually, our systems are robust in that they'll be able to take care of that. And you, as a user, wouldn't really see any problems from that. Maybe you'll see like a tenth of a second higher latency than you usually would. But I don't know. Usually, Canada, that's not something second, you notice. Canada comes second, right? Once the US is updated, Canada is next, right? 
I, I don't know. It depends on the distance, I guess, if you take the speed of light into account for the electrons traveling, uh, then you might be a couple of milliseconds behind. But I doubt the average user will notice that. All right. Uh, by the way, John, do you use uh, um, that GPS synchronization service uh, that uh, Matt Katz talked about in January? I'm not sure uh, what you called it, something with S. I remember correctly. Uh, he said that uh, uh, it's one of the it's part of the innovations that Google has made, uh, and that has made it uh, successful. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was something like this: using a GPS uh, in order to coordinate synchronization, server synchronizations. On that and I'm I I don't know which which part you're referring to. I Snapper was it? I'm not sure. Yeah, I. I mean, we use a lot of systems internally, and especially when it comes to to replicating data across data centers, you have to like be really smart with times and timestamps so that you don't overwrite someone else's change. So that's something that takes a lot of work, and even sometimes things like uh, when when we have like a leap second. That's something that sometimes causes problems in, in the infrastructure, because if things aren't completely aligned properly, then uh, we don't really know which changes are newer, which changes are old. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, if you compare two websites uh, with equal Google score, but website A has less new pages per month and website B has a strong growth of new pages, would Google prefer website B? Um, not always, I guess. Uh, we, we try to take into account a number of different factors, and relevance is something that's really hard to kind of nail down and say, if you make more updates on your page, it'll be more relevant. Sometimes pages that don't, don't have any updates for years are more relevant than pages that, or websites that keep pushing out new pages all the time. So that's not something where I'd say there is a magic factor that, uh, uh, gives preferential treatment to websites that keep publishing new pages or websites that don't publish new pages. Um, you mentioned that URLs can be indexed if they're blocked by robots text but uh, have external links to them. But presumably, they're not blocked by robots but have a no index. They would never be indexed. Uh, yes, if we can crawl the URLs and we see the robots no index tag, then we won't index them. So from that point of view, if you block it by robots text and have a no index, then we can't see the no index, and we might index the URL, not the content because we can't crawl it, but we might index the URL. Um, if it's not blocked by robots text and has a no index, then we won't be able to index that. Uh, what could be the possible reason of my mobile website coming in desktop search uh, query and indexing? I'm using alternate and canonical tags as per Google guidelines. In desktop, I'm redirecting mobile crawler to mobile website. Um, usually, if for normal queries you're seeing your mobile site in the desktop search results, then you've probably set up something wrong with regards to the connection between those two pages. Because if we can see that connection, uh, if you have the canonical set up to the desktop page, then we'll show the desktop page for normal searches. On the other hand, if you're explicitly searching for those mobile URLs, so if you're like doing a site call on m.mywebsite.com, then it's possible that we show you those mobile URLs because we think, hey, this guy is really looking for these specific URLs, and we know that these mobile URLs are associated with your normal website, then we'll say, well, if you explicitly want them, we'll show them to you. So, this is something where I'd first take a look at what you're searching for. If you're searching for normal queries and you're seeing your mobile site in the desktop search results, then that's something where probably you have the technical setup a bit incorrect. If you're explicitly looking for the URLs and you see the mobile website in the desktop search results, then that's not something where I'd say anything is going wrong. That might be completely expected from our point of view. Um, I have a question regarding the answer box and structured data. Could you provide more clarity on when Google search results generates an answer box? Does any structured markup help Googlebot in using one page's content over a result over others? Um, 
essentially the, the answer box, which is, I think, what they refer to is that the kind of bigger search results on top. That's something we see as a type of snippet. So it's not something where we explicitly look for any specific markup or we treat it in a different way. It's, we think this is a type of snippet that makes sense for the user, and we'll try to show that to the user. So that's something where there's no specific markup that you would need on your page for us to pick that up on. But we kind of like to see that content, of course, on the page. And if it's structured in a clear way, then that helps us to pick that up and show that to the user appropriately. John, have you seen those action links, what I'm calling them action links? They have like little blue icons with arrows. Yeah, I saw them, I think, on your blog. Yeah. Um, I imagine this is something that the team is experimenting with to, to kind of see which, which way it makes sense to show links to the websites to encourage users to go to those websites directly as well. So that's something we're, we're always looking into different ways of doing that. I think we've done experiments with like the icon of the website there with a, a specific call to action, uh, those blue links that you mentioned. Uh, we're kind of trying to figure out what makes sense in these situations. How can we encourage users to go to the website for more information if they need that? And uh, that's something where I imagine over time we'll see even more experiments. Exciting. Thank you. Uh, by the way, the name of the um, service, the GPS in transition service, the MapSet, it was called Spanner. Spanner, so. yes. Is that something that is used uh, for uh, Google search data centers as well? We use that for lots of different types of data that we do transfer and synchronize like that, yeah. We, we try to keep these technologies a bit generic so that we can use them for anything, uh, so that if something like Gmail decides to, to move out or do something fancy, then they can just use the same technology. Uh, can you give us more information about the recent algorithm update? I don't have anything specific to announce there, so I'll go with that tweet. Oh, I should have looked it up. Um, but I don't have anything specific that I can add there. Uh, here's another one about the Teak update. I'm guessing that refers to the same thing. Um, I noticed you sent out more warnings to non-mobile-friendly sites recently. I got one, too. I got one, too, as well. Yeah. Um, is this a sign you're beginning to use mobile-friendly as a ranking factor in search? I think this is essentially a first step to keep uh, webmasters informed and to let them know about these issues as we find them. Um, some of these sites are obviously going to be easier to, to update to mobile-friendly. Some of them are... The, Pretty tricky. I know some of the sites I made with, I don't know, embarrassing front page back in the days that used table-based layout. Uh, those are things that are really hard to move to a mobile-friendly design. But uh, this is something where when you start working on it, when you start uh, getting some practice on that, it gets a little bit easier over time. So if you getting these messages, I take that into account and think about what you want to do with those sites in the long run maybe find a way to make them mobile friendly too. Uh, John, if I can, uh, I had a, well, since we're talking about algorithm, uh, I had a question about uh, actually Rob's site, uh, but this is mostly out of curiosity, uh, because I know, and Matt said uh, uh, several times that uh, you try to be as efficient as possible with algorithm, algorithms, and uh, uh, try to, I don't know, maybe 99 or percent or even higher efficiency so you don't have a lot of false positives. But false positives are a reality. They do happen. And um, when they happen, it's kind of hard to just flag that website and correct it right away. They need to go through a whole uh, a new version of the algorithm. So is that something that might have happened to Rob's website be a false positive for a certain a uh, web spam algorithm or something like that, and uh, this is why there's pretty much nothing he, he can do himself or you can do manually to change that? I wouldn't call that specific case a false positive, but in general, that's, that's always something that can happen. 
So we, we do try to keep our algorithms as general as possible. Uh, we do try to minimize any, any kind of uh, wrong recognition of, of websites as being problematic. Um, and for the most part, we don't have any, any kind of special whitelist where we can say, well, this website is actually OK. Therefore, we'll take it out of this algorithm. Um, for some individual cases, we, we do have that ability. So that depends a bit on, on the algorithm itself. So for a lot of the general search algorithms, we, we don't have that ability. But for some individual algorithms, we do need to be able to kind of take manual action and say, well, for example, the safe search algorithm is picking up on these words on this website as being adult, adult website similar. But actually, they're talking about, I don't know, animals or something completely unrelated. And in those kind of cases, the safe search algorithm would have kind of a whitelist where we can say, well, this is a problem that we're picking up on incorrectly with the algorithm. We'll add them to the whitelist for the moment. We'll work to improve the algorithm so that they don't kind of take this into account in the long run. But uh, in the meantime, we can kind of, like as a stopgap measure, help that. So that's something where that sometimes makes sense. We don't have that for a lot of the other algorithms, like, like Penguin and Panda. So it's not that we would say, well, this website is being recognized as kind of problematic from a quality point of view. We'll put it on the whitelist, and it'll be seen as perfectly fine. That's not something that uh, the search quality team would want to do. So or, it, yeah. it kind of depends on the algorithm. Oh, but since you said that drop site is in the false positive case, uh, then why uh, why do you say there is absolutely nothing he can do to to alter? the situation he's currently in, other than, I don't know, building a new or moving the website to a new domain? Um, it's a tricky case where, where I don't really have much liberty of, of saying much oh, okay. about what's actually happening. So I, I don't really have much I can share there. And I think this is, is one of the individual cases where I don't really see this happening to a lot of other websites. So this is pretty much unique in, in, its, in its kind like this, I guess. So mm -hmm. it's not really that helpful for other people who are like stuck in similar situations on a website and don't really know what to do. But uh, I, I know this is frustrating, and uh, I wish I had something more specific I could share with you, uh, with you, Rob, with uh, the rest of you as well. Uh, but I, I don't have anything that I can bring up. With that. OK. Sorry, Rob. All right, uh, two short questions. Is it useful to connect keywords with more than one word with uh, semantic connectors? Um, I don't think you really need to do anything fancy with like two words mentioned on a page. If you're writing a sentence, if this is a, a part of a sentence, you don't really need to connect those words in any kind of artificial way. Uh, when searching for your brand, Google always suggests a spelling correction. Might this have a negative impact? Um, that sounds like um, people are generally searching for something slightly different than your brand name. So on the one hand, this is something that will change over time as people kind of get to know your brand and actually want to search for your brand. On the other hand, in, in the short term, it might be a bit frustrating because people will probably be searching for the other name instead. But uh, this is something where if you're setting up a new brand, if you're setting up a new company, a new website, this is something I'd always kind of take into account as well. Um, what are people actually searching for? Is this a name that's going to be confusing for people? Or is this, some, this something where people will kind of know how to search for my website if they want to go directly to my website? Uh, does Google use meta, geo region, geo place name, geo position, et cetera, for local search results? No, we don't use that at all. So that's something where if you want to geo target, then I'd use the normal geo targeting. Uh, you can also use the hreflang if the, you're targeting specific language country variations. Um, but we don't take into account the geo region meta tags. Um, I forgot what the overall name for those was, but we, we don't take those into account. 
Can I um, just uh, quickly just make a small transition into bots? Bots, okay. Yeah, because, I mean, uh, there's a study out there that 56% of bot traffic is, uh, is 56% of, of uh, traffic out there is bots. And I just wanted to know, um, can bad impersonator bots uh, hurt a website? Impersonator bots. So how yeah. do you mean? Um, fake bots. Um, I don't think that would be a problem. I, I'm not really sure what you would do with uh, fake bots or kind of impersonator bots, but I a lot of like uh, spammers, I guess, out there, right? And I just wanted to know, um, like blocking them would that uh, affect a website? No. No. no, I mean if if these are, I don't know, scraper bots that are running across the web, just copying content down, or sending like fake refers, those kind of things. That's, I don't know. Feel free to block that. I mean, from our point of view, as long as you're not blocking Googlebot, then that's not something that would be affecting us. Okay. Um, there might be like some subtle user agents where you would essentially be blocking us if it's coming from Google. Uh, things like the, the PageSpeed Insights testing tool, I believe, uses a special user agent. Uh, the, of course, the mobile crawlers, those kind of things, these special user agents. But uh, there are tons of bots out there. And uh, from my, my point of view, feel free to block those. If, they're not, if you can tell that they're not actual users, if you can tell that they're not doing anything useful with your content, then sure. OK. Thank you. I mean, these things have been happening for, I don't know, since the beginning. So this isn't really something that would be new to us if uh, sites are crawling our sites or, or bots are kind of like crawling our search results even. That's something we're kind of used to, and we're kind of uh, have a bit of practice handling as well. But yeah, no, just looking at server logs and stuff, and it doesn't look good. So there's one yeah. uh, specific site that uh, it just doesn't look good, and uh, it makes sense to do that. You know? Sure. I mean, the, you always have to find a balance between how much work you put into actually blocking these and how much resources they're taking away from your server. And if these are things that are crawling your server and your server doesn't, doesn't care at all about that, then I don't know if it's really worth the time to actually try to find a way to block them. But if these are causing problems on your server, if they're stealing your bandwidth and kind of scraping your site in a way that's bogging down your server, then sure. Because what's happening is, imagine if you put it through a third party, and then you can see, like, you know, where's 90% uh, of the traffic coming from. And because of this specific, you know, crazy bot, uh, you see that most of the traffic is coming from the Philippines. Yeah. And uh, that's not a good thing, you know? I mean... Not a good thing. From from our point of view, it doesn't really matter where your traffic yeah. is coming from. Uh, but obviously, if, if you're targeting a different country, and you can tell that all of these visits are bots that are completely useless for your website, then sure, feel free to block them. I think there was a question similarly somewhere in here about uh, analytics, where some some spammers are doing referral spammer, referral spamming again, where they're sending a refer with the the request that they're doing for a website, and that's showing up in, I believe, analytics. And that's also something you can feel free to block. If you can tell these aren't real users, block them, do whatever you want with them. I mean, this is not something that would affect us. OK. All right. Uh, I'm going to take my site down and use some of my content on my new site. Will this affect the rankings of that page, even though my old site is gone? Um, so if you take the old site down, obviously we're not going to be able to rank that as soon as we crawl and re-index those pages and see that they're gone. Uh, if you use some of the content on your new site, that's something we'll try to treat separately. Um, it'll be a little bit different if you do a one-to-one -one copy of your whole website and put that on a new domain. Because then we'll look at that and say, well, this is a one-to-one -one copy of this existing page. Maybe the webmaster meant to do a site move, and we'll just treat it as a site move instead. So if that's something where you're just taking snippets of information from your old site and putting them on something completely new, then that's essentially something separate. 
I'm still confused how the disavow works. Can you give an example of how it works? OK. Um, so essentially, the disavow tool is meant to take uh, links that you don't want to have associated with your website out of our system. So if, for example, a previous SEO went and bought links from one website to your website, and you can't remove those links, and you want to make sure that these paid links are not taken into account by our algorithms, then you can use the disavow tool to let us know about those specific links or let us know about the whole website and say, everything from this other website here that's referring to my website should be taken out of account from, from Google's systems. So that's essentially what you're doing with the disavow tool. Uh, you can also use that if you find really problematic links that are happening to your website that you don't know where they're coming from. You can essentially say, well, I don't want to be associated with these links at all, and uh, submit that in the disavow file, and then we'll take that out of our systems and out of our calculations. Um, do you know the Latch application? If so do you think that in the future will be in your service? I don't know the Latch application, so I don't know what that would be. Um, I host subdomains. I don't want Google to index. I can't use robots text or meta text to exclude them from indexing. Is there a way that I can prove to Google that I own the TLD and add the subdomains to blacklist? This would improve your index. Uh, that's that's an interesting question. So essentially, if if you have a subdomain that you don't want Google to index, the best thing there would be to kind of serve some kind of a server-side authentication on those URLs, so that when we try to crawl those URLs, we'll see something like a password prompt, and we'll know, okay, this is not something that we can crawl, and then we won't even bother trying to crawl deeper or trying to to index that content. So if you can do server-side authentication, that's probably the best solution there. Um, you could also do that based on the IP address. For example, if this is a subdomain that you only use internally, then maybe block all requests that are not coming from your IP addresses or from your uh, users' IP addresses. So that's something you could do to kind of prevent us from even trying to get into that. Another thing you can do is you can use Webmaster Tools DNS verification. Uh, which basically means you add a special uh, element to your DNS settings, and we can use that to confirm that you own this subdomain or this uh, domain name, for example. And within Webmaster Tools, you can do a site removal request, which is, I believe, valid for 90 days, uh, where you can tell us this content should not be indexed or should be removed immediately in case some of it is indexed already. Um, generally, I recommend sticking with something that's more permanent, something like the authentication, than to rely on a site removal request because these uh, expire after 90 days, and if you go on vacation at the wrong time or whoever is kind of tracking this uh, forgets to watch out for this, then that content might suddenly pop up again in the index. Uh, so using something that is resilient uh, based on uh, settings, uh, that's something I'd, I'd recommend doing there more. And that's something that would also work across search engines. So if this is a subdomain you don't want indexed at all, then if you're blocking a request from outside IP addresses, then Bing won't index it either. Yandex won't be able to index it either. It'll essentially be removed by default. Uh, hey, John. I had a similar case uh, quite recently, a hosting company that uses reverse IP subdomains uh, with uh, so basically the web the subdomains contain the websites that uh, are of these clients that are do have separate domains, but uh, he's using uh, this reverse IP uh, subdomains for technical thing. I'm not sure why, but he he kind of needed them. So uh, obviously he cannot use robots.txt uh, because that would also block the, uh, the original domain. And uh, no or robots tag with no index. So what would be the best approach there? Um, I guess like using server side authentication, something like that. I don't know if that that would work in that specific case. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but essentially, I, I'd really try to focus on something that works uh, permanently, that doesn't rely on like, unique characteristics of Google that works across all search engines. Because otherwise, someone will kind of access those URLs accidentally on their own and copy the content down or scrape it or whatever. So if you use something like authentication, if you use something based on IP address, maybe based on a cookie, I, I don't know how you want to do that. That's something that's probably going to be more robust than just like uh, something very specific to Google. Uh, well, one idea was to use a, just a different TLD uh, in order to move the reverse IP subdomains to it. So we're sure they, yeah. they sure. don't proceed. Yeah. Okay. Sure. That that would work too. John, is there an update on when the new search queries report is coming out uh, for beta testers? We're working on that. I, I I don't know if like all of you are on the list, but I saw a lot of familiar names in, in the submissions. Uh, what's probably going to happen is we'll set up a, a version for part of the people that signed up possibly this week, possibly next week. And uh, we'll set up a slightly different version for another part of the people who signed up so that we can kind of compare how, how people are actually using this. And uh, that's something where I imagine over the next couple of weeks you'll find out more. And it's it's still a very early preview, so I wouldn't expect this to be the final UI. I wouldn't expect this to be kind of like the final state. But uh, it's really important for us to get as much feedback as possible on this. So if you see someone write about this somewhere, then give us feedback. If you think this looks good, let us know. If you think this looks terrible, then let us know, too. I mean, these, these are things we need to know. Um, how often uh, does All right, go uh, for it. I wanted to ask you um, about the, the message that I sent earlier uh, regarding these uh, guys I heard about from someone that are doing the uh, CTR manipulation, dwell time manipulation that they're claiming in their selling this as a service. So uh, someone told me that you know they'd gotten hooked into doing uh, using a service like this and they hadn't realized that it was specifically against Google's guidelines. So I thought uh, that it may be uh, just as a suggestion something to include in there more specifically, but on the other hand, uh, there is that part of the guidelines uh, which uh, does cover in a in a general way, where it says in, on uh, number three, avoid tricks intended to improve search engine ranking. So I guess that pretty well covers any of these tricks of manipulation. But those guys out there that are hawking these services saying, you know, now you can't do link buy buying and uh, other things that are against Google's guidelines, but it's okay to do this uh, uh, crowd search uh, function, you know, where you, you uh, trick the, uh, uh, try and trick with queries and, and whatever that they're yeah. doing, so. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's always been the case that people are doing crazy stuff and that they think play, plays a big role in our search algorithms, and that's probably not the case. And uh, that's not something that where we like explicitly list everything that doesn't play a role in our algorithms or everything that doesn't matter or everything that's kind of sneaky in some regards uh, in, in our webmaster guidelines. So from that point of view, I mean, if, if people are doing this and they think this is nice, then fine. If people like putting a pink background on their website, then I, I don't know. This is There are lots of really useful ways to spend time and money on making a website to work really well. So. I don't know. That's not something where, where I'd explicitly go out and say, this is bad, and you need to do it differently, or you need to do something slightly different to, to make that useful. I, 
I don't know. This is not something where we probably put that out in the web master guidelines. This Deep, DeepMind, DeepMind, and Google, uh, Google Bot are working quite close, closely together. No, John. DeepMind. I think DeepMind was an acquisition that we did last year or the year before that. I don't really know where all of their technology is being used. Okay. So, I I don't know. <laughs> Right. We uh, do use artificial uh, intelligence in, in search as well, so it, it's possible that some of that is used there, but I, I don't really know. Uh, right. Another question um, regarding uh, a client who uh, asked about um, whether it would be cloaking, or they assumed that it would be cloaking if they were to uh, not serve ads to Google bots that are being seen by uh, many or most other users, or they were to show uh, different uh, quantity or types of ads. So is that safe to assume that uh, that would not be uh, acceptable? Well, anytime they're serving Googlebot something different than what normal users would see, then that's cloaking. So if they're like serving a different page to Googlebot in, in subtle ways, that that's still cloaking. If they're serving something completely different uh, to Googlebot, then that would be cloaking as well. So that's something where when we talk to, in to engineers, anytime we see this kind of thing happening, they're really not happy with that because it makes their lives very hard and also it makes uh, the webmaster's life very, very hard. So, for example, we've seen this quite a bit with regards to mobile websites where websites will cloak a subtly different version to Googlebot and they'll cloak the same subtly different version to Googlebot mobile as well. Uh, where actually we would see the desktop version again because they have the special version for Googlebot. So that's something that causes a big problem for us because when you access a site on a smartphone, you see a nice mobile-friendly site, but when you access it with Googlebot smartphone, you see that cloaked desktop site instead. So okay. any kind of cloaking like that just makes it extremely hard for the webmaster to diagnose any kind of problems because you don't really know which version Googlebot is really seeing. It makes it really hard for our engineers to kind of take action on the content that we see there. And uh, it's something we have in our webmaster guidelines as well. So if you're trying to do trying to do something misleading there, then that's something where even the web spam team might take action. So as much as possible, um, really try to avoid cloaking. Did you get my email uh, regarding the spamming? We'll mix that up to Yes. You have. Yes, yes. Um, let me go through some of the questions here. Um, how often does the hreflang and webmaster tools get updated, and what is no return tags? Um, I think we had a slight issue there with the hreflang data and webmaster tools for maybe a week or a couple of days at least. Uh, where we showed a bunch of errors that weren't actually errors, but we, I think we fixed that fairly quickly. Um, it might be that it takes a little bit longer to kind of update that data now. So I believe it should be refreshed in the meantime, but it might be that it's still maybe a week behind, something like that. But that data should get updated fairly frequently every couple of days, something around that time. And uh, no return tags means that uh, you don't link back so, for example, the English page refers to the French page over here, and the French page doesn't refer back to the English page with the hreflang tag. Then we, we kind of like miss that confirmation that there is a connection between these two pages. And in those cases, we don't take that hreflang tag into account. So if you have an English page and a French page, make sure that they're kind of connected to each other with hreflang and not just from one side. So this is related with the first question you have you've answered for me, right, John? As that was the point. Yes, exactly. Event. You had you had that in the sitemap file. In the sitemap file, if you just have one URL tag, then you essentially have just from one side the hreflang tag. If you have it directly on the pages, then of course even there you have to have. 
that confirmation back. Uh, how do you get on the better testing list? We did a Google Plus post from the Google Webmasters account, I believe maybe two or three weeks back, um, requesting people can sign up there. So I check out the Google Webmasters Google Plus account and maybe scroll back a couple of pages to see where we have that form. You can still sign up there. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to take everyone into account for the beta testing of this new feature, but we'll try to kind of do it in steps, like I mentioned. Uh, is the Google Site Link search box mainly for well-known brands or highly searched sites that have a search box on their site? Uh, we do try to show this algorithmically when we think it makes sense for the user, and sometimes that's something where people try to go into deeper content. So it's not that it explicitly targets brands. It's not that it explicitly targets well-searched sites, but rather sites where we think it helps the user to be able to search for something specific within that website, kind of like we do with site links, where you can jump to specific parts of the site. Uh, how to effectively ban and block a spam refer in analytics? Um, I think that someone did a couple of blog posts about how to block this in HD access, which might be one way to do it. From our point of view, you can block these kind of spammers or referral spam in whatever ways you think makes sense. Um, I have an English-French site. I'm confused with the language tag. Um, we have a lot of information in the Help Center about the hreflang tag. So it's H-R-E-F-L-A-N-G, uh, which is a way to kind of connect these pages. Um, I can see if we can do maybe a more specialized Hangout in the future with uh, some explicit examples on how you could set that up. Um, but I, in the meantime, I'd really recommend taking a look at the Help Center, at the blog posts that we did. They cover this as well. All right, um, kind of running out of time. Let me see, here's one. In a professional journal, I've read uh, that for Google, the order of the H tags is important. Uh, is that true? No, you can essentially use them however you want. Uh, we do try to understand the structure of a page based on these tags partially. But uh, if you have a reason for doing them in a different way, or you have multiple H1 tags on a page, then that's absolutely fine. That's not going to cause any significant problems. Is it true that Google also looks at the size of the font? Uh, uh, for example, to understand that that is the title of the page, even if it's not marked with an H1 or H2 tag? I imagine. I don't know. I don't know for sure. I mean, we, we try to understand how the page is structured, especially with some of the older layouts that are table-based. That's not really trivial to do. Uh, with a lot of the HTML5 layouts that we see nowadays, they have a really nice semantic structure to them. So it's a lot easier for us to pick that up. Uh, when will be the next Google PageRank update? Yeah. Probably never. Why? Um, this is something I think we've stopped updating, at least at the toolbar page rank that's shown. Um, I don't know the future of the toolbar in general, but at least from the page rank side, this is probably something we're not going to be updating again. I we believe the last update was, was even an accident where someone said, oh, something is broken here. Let me just fix this and run this script that updates page rank. And then suddenly it was updated, and nobody really noticed. So this is something where I think we're probably not going to do any updates here. I think this is uh, not really a metric that's really useful to webmasters. So I focus on other metrics instead. Uh, John, can I step in with a short? <laughs> sure. Thing? I mean, uh, this uh, toolbar page rank was somehow an a number which helps finding a website if it's a spam from just a blink of an eye. I mean, you take a look at it, and you see it has some page rank, some amount. And that would help you seeing that it's a, it is a spam spammy or not. 
is just one example. I mean, you see a bunch of commercials, and you don't know if you want to stay there or not. And that would help. <laughs> and I have some I, other. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think just just based on links, it's it's a kind of um, a weird metric nowadays. So, at at least from a webmaster point of view, I'd really focus on something else, like like conversions, like uh, how people are actually using your website. Um, those, yeah, well, those kind of things. I was just thinking, can you give us another example of how can you tell, from another standpoint, uh, if a website is trustworthy or not? Just like on YouTube, for instance, you know, you have 7,000 views, right? I mean, you, you know how many people watched, how many people hated it before you even yeah. press. Yeah, but right now you, you don't have anything uh, yeah. to base, to put your uh, uh, skills on or based on to make a sudden decision to see if this is a spammy website or not. So, um, I can't think of anything offhand. Um, Maybe you could take I, this into consideration. Yeah, it's it's kind of tricky because uh, things like Chrome, the newer browsers, they don't have these toolbars that that frequently. So even if there were a metric, I don't think that's something that a lot of people would see because nobody likes installing toolbars and having all of this, this stuff on their on their browser anymore. So I I don't know. I it'll be tricky, but uh, it's it's a good question. Yeah. So the metric is still served though. In other words, if it's not going to be used, uh, you'd think it might be useful to turn that off. At some point, I know I they could see that happening. happening. Yeah, I could see that happening at some point. Um, that's I. I mean, like you said, at some point it's just going to be old and stale, and nobody cares about it anymore. And if nobody's using the toolbar anymore, then why would we even keep those systems running? But uh, I think this is is a more like medium term, long term discussion of what we actually do with uh, those scripts. Yeah, well, you're right. You're correct, John. But I think you should think about it. I mean, to take it as a suggestion that we need also uh, something which can tell from a fast view if you can trust that w website or not. Yeah, trust is always a really hard problem. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's always a hard thing too. All right, um, I have to go. Um, someone else needs this room. And so thank you all for your time, your questions, all of the questions that were submitted, uh, your feedback here in the Hangout as well. Uh, it's very appreciated. Next week, we have a special Hangout with um, a member of the Google News team. If you have a Google News website, a website in Google News, uh, then I definitely tune in then. If you do have a website in Google News and want to join us live, then make sure you comment on the, the thread from Google Webmasters so that we know that you're interested and we can invite you a little bit ahead of time. Um, but past that, thank you all again, and I hope you guys have a great week. Thank you, John. You time. too. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.